Hello, this is Andrew Womack, and I just wanted to wish all of you a very Merry Christmas. You know, this is a special time of the year, and sometimes it gets overwhelmed and obscured by all of the presents and the parties and everything else, but really, it is to celebrate the advent of the most important thing that ever happened, and that's Jesus becoming a man. Praise God for Jesus. Praise God for Jesus loving us enough that He came and suffered for 33 years, being limited to a physical body, and then suffered on the cross for our salvation, bore our sicknesses. Praise God for Jesus. Man, I just rejoice at this time of the year. And I wanted to wish you a very Merry Christmas to you and all of your family. And praise God, remember that Jesus is the reason for the season. God bless you. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack. Celebrating the good news of Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. We here at Andrew Womack Ministries want to wish you a very Merry Christmas and a blessed New Year. Welcome to our Tuesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing a series that I've been teaching now for this is my third week teaching on You've Already Got It. That's the title of a book that I've got. And I've also got this in a study guide. This is the same material that's in the book. It's just reformatted so that you can teach other people, so that you can teach Sunday school, Bible studies, or just, uh, you know, a small group. And I tell you, this is something that is so foundational that I really encourage every single one of you to please get the materials. Uh, I've been teaching for over two weeks on this now, and yesterday I spent nearly the entire day kind of summarizing what I've said in two weeks. I haven't got time to go back through that, but let me just bring up two of the statements that I've made that to me summarize some of the most important things that God has shown me. First of all, one of the statements is that faith is not something we do to get God to respond to us. Faith doesn't move God. God is already moved by grace, and here's one of the statements. Faith is just our positive response to what God has already done. Now that is pregnant with a lot of meaning. Man, you need to meditate on that, get the materials, understand what that means. The second statement is that faith doesn't make God do anything. Faith only appropriates what God has already provided by grace. And I taught on this last week, but Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 says, you're saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Faith doesn't save you. Grace doesn't save you by itself. You have to put faith in God's grace. Grace is what God does for you, independent of you. It has nothing to do with you. God moves by grace, and He's provided salvation, healing, deliverance for every single person. But you have to respond in faith, and faith is a response to what God has done through grace. It is not something you do to gain a response from God. Those are huge statements. And if you've missed any of this teaching, you need to get that, even if you've heard it. I tell you, you need to study this because this is radical. It is diametrically opposed to the way most people think. Let me use an example here. Out of Isaiah chapter 45, verse 11, here's a passage of Scripture that used to just, uh, you know, befuddle me. I mean, I could not understand what this meant. And most of you probably don't have this underlined in your Bible because it's a problematic Scripture if you don't understand the things that I'm trying to teach right here. In Isaiah chapter 45, verse 11, it says, Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and His Maker, Ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the works of my hands. Command ye me. Now that is a radical statement, but this is in the Bible, and this is God speaking, and He says, Command ye me. Now, again, the negative reaction to this, most people, and I did this for a long period of time until I got understanding on it, but most people would sit there and say, we can't command God. God is almighty. He's the Lord God almighty. I can't command Him. The average person comes to God as a beggar. They come saying, God, we are nothing. We have nothing. 
We can do nothing, but we know that you can do all things. We ask you to stretch forth your hand. We ask you to do this, and we come before God. I heard uh, one of my instructors, Greg Moore, say this just recently, and it really blessed me, that most people come before God like a person going to get an unsecured loan. In other words, you don't have any assets. You don't have anything that would make the person want to give you a loan. And you, in a sense, are coming with your hat in your hand and just begging that, God, I'm just begging you, would you please move in my, in my life? And that's the way that most people operate. This is just the opposite. God said concerning the works of my hand, command ye me. What does that mean? And let me use an illustration here to illustrate what I think this is talking about. It's like electricity. You know, many of you are watching me at home. Now, we're on all kinds of devices. You can watch on all of these devices, but let's just say that you're watching television at home. And if you were at home and if you wanted to turn on the television, if you are, let's use this example. If you wanted to turn on the lights in your home, you don't call the electric company and say that I know that I haven't done everything I should, but you know, would you please just turn on the lights? The electric company doesn't turn on the lights for you. They generate the power. They deliver it to your house. They have a contract with you and they generate the power, but it's at your command. You have to go over there in a sense, command that electricity to turn on. You have to flip the switch. You couldn't call the electric company and say, you know, my favorite television program's coming on. Would you please come and turn on the television set? Would you please come and do these things? They generate the power that produces and runs all of these appliances and, and, and electrical things that you have in your home, but they do not turn on the electricity. They don't control it. You control it. In that sense, you command <clears throat> the electricity. And see, in a sense, that's what God is saying right here. God has already provided everything that you will ever need. You don't need to go to him and say, oh, God, would you please heal me? It says that by his stripes you were healed. Now, are you going to take your authority and your position in Christ? And are you going to say, Father, thank you that before I ever got sick, you had already provided the healing. You have put the same healing power on the inside of me that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, Ephesians 1, 19. And so I've got it. And I thank you that you have given me this power and authority. And you said in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21, that death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it will eat the fruit thereof. And so, Father, I just, right now, I receive it. I receive what you've done, and I use the power that's in my tongue to release it, and I say, healing come in the name of Jesus. I'm commanding this healing power of God that Jesus has, per, has uh, purchased and put on the inside of me. I'm commanding it to flow. Body, I command you to function. I command you to respond right now. See, that's what this is talking about. And if you understand it like that elect, uh, illustration of electricity, it helps me to understand that you couldn't go to the electric company and say, we've got people coming over for a Bible study. And, you know, this is so important. I mean, people's lives could be changed. Would you please turn on the electricity? Would you please turn on the heater? No, they generate the power, but it's at your disposal. It's under your command. In a sense, that's the way that God is. God has already anticipated everything that you will ever need, and He's put this power on the inside of you. Now you have to flip the switch. You have to start speaking. And see, when people, when, when you talk about this, people that don't understand, they'll sit there and they'll come back and they say, so you're saying that you're bigger than God, so that you're making God do something. No, I'm only making God do what He's already done. If He's already done it, it's not me making Him do it. It's not me. I'm not the power source. But the power source has generated the electricity, has put it at my disposal, and it's not going to work until I go over there and flip the switch. I'm not making that electricity in my home do anything that it wasn't designed to do. But it is at my command. I am not making God heal me or heal other people but it is at my command. I'm not the power source. I could take a light bulb and stick it in my mouth and the thing will never light. 
It'll never come on. It is not my power. It's not me. But that power has been given to me. And when I flip the switch, the lights come on. When I, when I turn on the television, when I push the buttons, these things work because I have been given command over those things. I am not the power source, but I am hooked into the power source. God has placed that power at my disposal, at my command. And concerning the work of His hands, the physical manifestation of the things that He's already purchased through Jesus, it's at my disposal. I can command the power of God. You know, when I first learned this, uh, one of the things that I did was I started teaching on this and I actually held a service. This was back in 1976. I was in Childress, Texas, and I taught on these exact same things, how that God has already done it. And if a person doesn't receive healing, deliverance, joy, peace, whatever it is that they're believing for, it's not God who's not giving, it's them that's not receiving. So instead of working on God's transmitter, I said, you need to work on your receiver. It's us, and we can build ourselves up in our most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Jude said that, Jude chapter 1, verse 20. And I, I was talking about how we can make the power of God manifest, not because we are greater in power, but because God has already done it. He wants to do it. His desire is for us to walk in health, even as our soul prospers, 3 John chapter 1, verse 2. And so we aren't making him do anything he doesn't want to do, but he's already done it. It's up to us to bring it into manifestation. So I taught on those things. I rented a, a, a room at this place called the Women's Department Club in Childress, Texas, and I held a meeting. I don't remember how many people were there. There might have been a maximum probably of 100 people or something like that. And I taught on these exact things. And then I said, all right, we're going to demonstrate it, that God has already done it. And if you haven't seen your healing manifest, it's not God who hasn't given, it's us that are having trouble receiving. And so after I'd preached on this, I said, now we're going to have show and tell. We're going to demonstrate this. And I said, who in here is sick or has some need? And there was a 17-year-old boy who came forward. And this boy uh, was blind in one eye and uh, couldn't even see light out of that eye. And so he asked for prayer. So I prayed for him. I took my authority. I rebuked all of these things, commanded sight to come. And after I'd prayed my best prayer, I asked him to cover up his good eye and look through his bad eye and asked, and, and asked if he could see me. I had my fingers up. And I said, how many fingers do I have up? And he was not even able to see a light. He was totally blind in that eye. And I... Uh, he couldn't see a thing. And I actually had to turn his head with, with my other hand and point it towards my fingers because he was even looking in the wrong direction. So it looked like nothing had happened. But I said, I know that what I'm teaching is true. I know that God has already done it. And if we don't see the manifestation, it's not God who hasn't given. It's us who haven't received. And I said, we're going to work on our receiver. And so I dismissed the people. And I said, if you've got some place to go, if you're ready to go, if you have any doubt, any fear about this, leave. But if you want to stand, if you believe that God has already done this and we can command the power of God, not in the sense that I'm forcing God to do something against His will, but I'm just enforcing what He's already chosen to do. I said, if you want to stand and then agree with me like that way, well, then stay and pray. And there was maybe 20 or 25 people who stayed, and we started praying for this boy. And we prayed for a long time. I think it was probably 30 minutes or less, but it seemed like forever. And every few minutes, every five minutes or so, I'd stop and I'd say, now cover up your good eye and look through your bad eye and what can you see? And he couldn't see a thing. And so it was discouraging and people were beginning to wonder about, does this really work? And so I was praying in tongues and asking God to just show me. I said, I know that you have already provided this healing. You aren't the problem. The problem is with us. What are we doing? What do we need to do to receive? And as I was praying and asking God to show me, I just had this thought come to me that he doesn't need a healing. He needs a miracle. 
And at that time, this is back 1976, I had never had that thought cross my mind that there was a difference between a healing and a miracle. And I still don't claim that I fully understand this, but as I was mulling that over and thinking about it and saying, is this God? Is this the problem that we need to believe for a miracle instead of a healing? As I was thinking about that, Don Crow, who was my associate pastor, and he was with me there, he, he interrupted and he says, God just spoke to me and said, he doesn't need a healing, he needs a miracle. I mean, it was exactly what God spoke to me. So I took that as confirmation and I just stopped everybody from praying. I said, so tell us what's wrong with your eye. And this boy said that when he was a little baby, he had an infection in his eye and they went in and surgically removed the lens and the retina from his eye. He says, I don't even have the parts of my eye that I need in order to be able to see. And so when I heard that, I said, man, you don't need a healing. You need a miracle. You need God to supernaturally create and put parts of your eye back in there. So we closed our eyes and started praying again, and we started speaking and commanding Isaiah 45, 11, concerning the works of my hands, commanding me. We started commanding a lens and a retina. And I remember cupping my hands like this and putting them over his eye and speaking and saying, I, I command a lens and a retina to come into this eye now in the name of Jesus. And then I had him cover up his good eye and look with his bad eye and tell me how many fingers I had up. And he said, one and two and whatever I did, he, he could see and his sight came. Now, I still don't completely understand all of the difference, but I'm saying that it wasn't God who didn't want him healed, that didn't release his power. It was us that was releasing it in the wrong direction, in the wrong way. Whatever happens, if you aren't seeing the miraculous power of God in your life, and if it's something that Jesus provided for us, such as healing, such as prosperity, such as joy and peace, and on and on you go... If it's something that Jesus provided by grace, then it's up to us to take our faith and just reach out and receive what God has done. Instead of coming as a beggar and saying, oh God, I am nothing, I have nothing, I can do nothing, you have to take your authority and say, no, Jesus has already done it. I've already got it. Jesus has already provided it. And now I am standing here and not in arrogance, not in ways of saying that I'm bigger than God, that I can force God to do something. Man, it, it doesn't have anything to do with that. But you're just saying, I believe that God has provided. As much as I believe that the electric company has provided the electricity and all I've got to do is go over there and flip that switch and the lights will come on. In the same way, I believe that God has provided healing and he has given me the authority and power. And so I am releasing this power right now. I command this to happen. That is a different attitude than the typical Christian who approaches God is, oh God, I am nothing, I have nothing, I could do nothing, but would you please pour out your power? You are not going to receive your healing. You are not going to receive the need meant when you approach God with that attitude. But you need to approach Him as, Father, thank you that you're a good God. And before I ever had this problem, you knew I was going to have this problem. You've already anticipated. You've already placed on the inside of me the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. I've got it. And now I am not asking you. You've already done it. I believe that I've already got it. Now I am speaking against the devil. I am speaking against this sickness. And you start using your authority. I believe that the number one reason that most people do not receive a physical manifestation of their healing is because they approach God with this wrong attitude that God has done nothing, but he could do it, and they approach him as a beggar, pleading and begging, oh God, please touch me. I tell you, when you understand that God loves you and he has already provided it, and now I'm not a beggar, I'm a commander. Not a com I'm not commanding God, but I'm commanding my body. I'm commanding the devil to get off of me. See, when I start approaching things that way, that's a totally different attitude. And let me just point out that this is the exact attitude that Jesus had in Mark chapter 11. I'm not going to take the time to turn over there and read all the scriptures. I hadn't got time on today's program, 
But you go study it, and Jesus went to a fig tree, and the fig tree had leaves, which a fig tree in Israel produces uh, the, the figs before it produces leaves. So if it had leaves, that means it should have had figs, but it didn't. And so he just cursed this fig tree, and he says, No man eat fruit of you hereafter forever. And over in Matthew's account of that, it says that immediately the tree died, but it, it looked exactly the same. It was the next day. It was 24 hours later as they walked back into Jerusalem and passed that same fig tree that his disciples noticed that the fig tree was dead from the roots up. It died instantly in the roots, and it took a brief period of time for what had happened below the surface to manifest above the surface. And when the disciples saw it, they were amazed and they pointed it out. And Jesus told them, he says, you need to have faith in God. And then he said, Mark eleven twenty three, 23, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Now here's Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith the one who operated in all of this perfectly because he was God manifest in the flesh. And notice how he said we were supposed to release our faith. We are supposed to speak unto the mountain, not talk to God about our mountain, not say, oh God, I've got this terrible problem. I've got this huge mountain of debt, this mountain of sickness or whatever, and would you please remove it? See, that's what most Christians are doing. But instead, he says, you speak to the mountain. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, not talk to God about it, but say unto the mountain. That implies right there that you know that God has already invested you with his power. You've got this ability. Now you are using it and you don't come as a beggar. You come as a commander saying in the name of Jesus, mountain, you get out of my way. You move. See, he said, you have to say to the mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and not doubt in your heart, but believe that those things which you say, not just the things that God says, God's word is forever settled, but you have to agree. You have to start saying what God says. And so this is is the exact same thing that we've been talking about. God by grace has already provided everything you will ever need whether it's finances, joy, peace, boldness, wisdom, understanding, healing, deliverance, anything that you'll ever need. God anticipated any need that you could ever have. He's already provided it. It is not up to God to do it. God has done His part. Now you need to believe that God has done His part. You've got to believe that when you got born again, and made Jesus your personal Lord, that he put on the inside of you the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19. That you have this power, and now you need to take that power and use it and command your situations to change. Command your body to respond. Command your finances to respond. Command your emotions to respond. And I tell you, when you quit being a beggar and start being a commander... It makes all of the difference in the world.